Amen. Amen. Good morning. So I am uh, Pastor Mike, one of the pastors here, and uh, I was uh, thinking about voices this week, and I, <clears throat> I actually, uh, yeah, it's kind of a surreal moment for me. So there was, there was a time where I was the main voice in this community. How bad was that? Okay. Um, and uh, really, over the last year, God has allowed a complementary of voices. And I was thinking about it uh, even this morning with, um, I was thinking about my sister. And so I'll see my sister here in a couple weeks around the holidays. And I remember on one occasion, she, uh, we both had two different guinea pigs. And uh, I, mine was Gigi and hers was Coco. And I remember I was like the main caregiver for both of those guinea pigs. And so her main voice in her life was not that guinea pig, it was candy. And so it was a few weeks after Halloween, and how many of you guys are almost out of candy already from Halloween? You're already out, there you go. My sister was running low on candy, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to take care of this guinea pig, I want to be a main voice into this guinea pig. So I went to her and I said, hey, I'll buy that guinea pig from you for two uh, Hershey Kisses and a Reese Pieces. No joke, she said, sure, I'll take it. So I ended up with two guinea pigs. Uh, and so, you know, again, I was just thinking about voices. And uh, it, it's amazing to me to see the voices that God has raised up in this community uh, to where I am no longer the main voice, which I think is healthy for any community because we each come with different gifts and different abilities. You sit here with different gifts and different abilities. And so to have a community that... Uh, <clears throat> honors and, and have a community that celebrates a variety of voices, not only from the platform, but also as a community as a whole, is a blessing. You don't see that a lot of places. And so as I was beginning to formulate, this was almost 10 years ago, uh, what, what is it that God wants us to create? What is Awaken supposed to be as a community of faith? And, and many, many people would look and, and and they wouldn't ask the hard question about who are we supposed to be. They would rather start saying, how do we start to gather just people? And I noticed just in a short period of time how quickly people just came and went. How quickly, especially in this area that is highly transient, highly military, it's like you may only have a period of time to be in somebody's life. So let's ask the hard question about who were we supposed to be and what are those things that we're supposed to hand off? And as I studied deeply within the scriptures, I didn't see Jesus focus a ton on gathering crowds of people. He focused more on what are the things that I want to hand off to really his 12 before he left this earth. And so we at Awaken really did a lot of hard work in the early years and have continued to this, this day asking that question. What are those things that we want to hand off? Not, our, not, not what does it look like for us to gather the largest worship gathering, not what does it look like for us to have the, <clears throat> the, the sexiest environment, not, not those kinds of questions, not what does it look like to have an amazing worship team, and, and, and I think they're pretty good. But what does it more look like for us all to look as disciples? That led us through a series of uh, <clears throat> a period of time in Awakens history where we, we said, all right, what are those things that we want to bind ourselves to? And that's where this idea of healing in came from, this idea of raising up, this idea of sending out. And really asking that question, all right, healing in. I think I have a definition up here. Is that right, Kelly? There we go. God brings healing to all aspects of our lives if we allow him. So it's this idea of what is God doing in you? What is God doing in you? And there are certain pathways or certain practices, and that's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, is what are those practices to bring us to a place really at the end of the day to hear God speak to us and then to be able to walk in obedience. And so healing in is about our communing with 
God himself, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The next one is raising up. And we said, okay, as a community of faith, we are not just told to commune with God alone, but we're told to commune with God in community. And so we looked around, and it was like people, God is raising people to their fullest potential as we walk tightly together. And as we studied and went through the scriptures, it was evident that God called us not to worship him in isolation, but to worship him in community. And so this idea of raising up, again, we're meant to live in community. We grow to our fullest potential as we live in community. Have you ever thought to yourself or recognized, man, the longer I hang out with that person, I'm starting to pick up their mannerisms. We raise to our fullest potential by the community we choose to invest ourselves in. That is a discipleship process. That is disciple. That is what this series is about. What are those pathways that lead us to a place to where I'm not only communing with God, I'm walking in community with others. So I'm not only asking the question, what is it God wants to do in me, but what is it God is doing around me? What is it God is doing around me? So that takes it an element further than just showing up and, and, and consuming a gathering, but now asking the question, how do I walk with these people through life? That's a lot of what happens within our missional communities. But as I read and as we studied and went through the scriptures, it wasn't just this idea of communing with God and being in community with others, but it was also this incredible idea, incredible idea through the scriptures that God says he would use his church to introduce his kingdom. And it's this idea of sending out. We're a missional people as our Lord is a missional God. So again, what are those practices? The whole intent of this series. What does it look like for us to be the people of God? To introduce to the world his kingdom. To be about the restoration of of all things, back to the kingship of Jesus himself. So there's two phrases that I want you to think about today as we jump into our two pathways today, which is generosity and stewardship. But the two phrases I want you to think about, what does it look like to be carriers of the gospel? And what does it look like to be creatives of the kingdom? And I believe both of those statements rest very heavily within this context of stewardship and generosity. And so as we get started into that, I want to show you a definition that I would use for stewardship and then a definition that I would use for generosity. So for stewardship... Being a good manager of all that God has entrusted to us. So it's this idea that what you have is not yours. It's God and he has entrusted it to us. There's a passage in scripture that uh, relates to this. It comes out of the parable of the talents. And it's this, it says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. How are we faithful with those things the Lord has given us? So again, the idea of stewardship. The next one is generosity. So generosity is having a heart to give freely and offer help to others. So it's receiving what the Lord gives us, stewardship, understanding it's the Lord's, it's not mine, and then reflecting that back out <clears throat> through generosity having a heart to give freely and offer help to others. Passage in Scripture out of the Psalms, it talks about the righteous. 
And it says, the righteous, they share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. So I have a question for you. We're talking about pathways. We're talking about what it looks like to be a disciple, which, which, which I've already shared with you from the very beginning pillars, foundation of Awaken. We were asking those hard questions. What does it look like, not for us just to gather together, but what does it look like for us to truly be disciples of Jesus in this world? What does it look like for us to hear God speak to us, to see that held accountable within a community, and then to see us walk in obedience? And so my question for you is, where do you think this idea of stewardship and generosity, this practice, if you will, of stewardship and generosity, where do you think that fits within this idea of communing with God, this idea of walking with a community of believers or being, uh, uh, being a sent people to the world? Where do you think that fits? Just yell it out. Does my stewardship and generosity have more to do with communing with God? Does it have more to do with each other? Or does it have more to do with the world that God has called us to reflect his kingdom to? What's that? Man, you guys are bright. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. And and so I was waiting for some people to say like the world, right? Because we give to a community of faith here so that we can impact the world. And I would say, yeah, that's true. That's right. I was waiting for others to say, well, aren't we called to to walk with other people and and to help them in their most desperate times? And I would say, absolutely. So it's like in the community, right? We're called to be generous within a community of faith. I would say, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then I would also argue that the way that we view the things that God has given us greatly affects the way that we view God himself. That's the one that I want to talk about today. That's the one that I want to talk about today. So there is... uh, There is this idea in, in marketing and branding. Does anybody here work in that world at all, marketing and branding? Anybody? No? Man, I can rough, have rough shot over this whole thing. Nobody would know the difference. <laughs> no, it's funny. One time I was coaching and uh, <clears throat> coaching a church planner, and I was sharing about some, uh, some studies that I had read on sociology and uh, how it in, impacts community and so forth. So, some different, you know, pretty precise things. And, and the one guy says, oh, yeah, I've met that person that did that study. I was like, oh, crap, I hope I shared that correctly. <laughs> and, and it turned out I did. So it was like, oh, whew, thank you. So there is a term in marketing and branding, and it's called expressive capital. Has anybody ever heard that term? You, you have? What, what is it? Do you remember what it is? You don't remember what it is? I won't tell your teacher. <laughs> Expressive capital. Has anybody heard that? Know what that is? Expressive capital. It's this idea that we create brands. We create brands that over time we can find our identity in. So it's this idea that brand A is better than brand B because brand A can help me find some of those missing pieces that I have in my life. So brand A, we can find missing pieces in that are better than brand B because brand A can fulfill certain things in my life that is lacking. And so the scriptures uh, in Acts, Paul says that it's within God himself that we live and move and have our being. Have you guys read through that passage? Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? So, So Paul says it's within God himself that we live and move and have our being. So we find our essence within God himself. Expressive capital would say it's through the brand 
that we move and live and have our being. And I know for many of us, we sit here and we're like, well, that's ridiculous. I would push back and say that we are all faulty of that. When we sit and we watch and we say it's those clothes, those clothes. Don't I look nice today? I was like planning what I was going to talk about and I was also planning what am I going to wear in the process. Hey, I'm only up here a few times, so I got to make the most of it. But it's within our clothes. It's within what we drive. It's within the, the, the places that we live that the cultural world tells us, screams at us, I go home and watch it later this afternoon in between the football games, in between whatever you're watching. Netflix and Hulu might be a challenge. But you'll see it as the marketers use this idea of expressive capital to tell you that your life will be better if what happens at the end of the day, our culture, I would argue, has created a religion. I'll say it again. Our culture has created a religion out of what we consume. I've actually, might be better just to read this. Money, greed, obsessions, consumerism as spirituality, and status and anxiety is our cultural driving force. I'll read it again. Money, greed, obsessions, consumerism as spirituality, and, and status, anxiety is our cultural driving force. And I'll ask this question. So <clears throat> how many of us if we are, are walking through an anxious you know, state for the day, maybe we're walking through struggles and trials within our life, how many of us would say, man, you know, it, it just feels good to walk through the mall? How many of us would say, you know what, it feels good just to go buy something? I would argue many of us, because our cultural screams to us, that you will feel better if you have my brand. I would argue that the uh, challenge in our time is to dethrone these many gods. These idols that promise the world, but I tell you, over time they will possess your soul. This is interesting. Liberty has become what choice, I'm sorry, liberty has become about choice and choice has become about what we consume. Our whole cultural system is set up on this idea of consumerism. And we view liberty as a choice, and we view my choice to do whatever I want to do with what I have and in the process to gain more. Now, as I say this, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with looking nice. But is my identity found in how I present myself and how I look? There's nothing wrong with grabbing a cup of coffee. At least I hope not grabbing a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Monty's hiding her coffee. <laughs> That's awesome. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with any of these things. But do we allow these things to rule our lives? Do we subconsciously over time find comfort 
and validity and security and stuff. You know, it's always amazed me that we are the richest country in the world. But I would argue we are the most unhappiest country in the world. As I have traveled overseas to some of the poorest regions of the world, who would give anything to you because they don't find value in what they have. They found value in their relationships. And again, I would argue this, this idea of generosity and stewardship <clears throat> at its core base level, at the foundational level, our culture has made a God out of what we have and what we can get. And I will be the first to say that I am guilty of that at times as well. There's a, uh, there's a quote here I want to read you. It's by a guy named uh, Dick Staub. He was a radio syndicate, an author, kind of a futurist, if you will. Follow along with me. He says, the largest companies in the world are spending billions of dollars to drive a diver diversionary, mindless, celebrity-fueled, popular culture down the highway of new technologies and into our lives in order to sell us stuff we don't want or need. They don't care about us, what we believe, or how we want to live. The ads and products regularly reduce women to sex objects and men to voyeurs and predators. Just watch the next deodorant commercial. They are unconcerned with what is in our best interests, spiritually or intellectually. And in fact, it is in their best interest to keep us spiritually desensitized and dumb. We're talking about a religion here. They play to our unhappiness, magnifying the feeling that we are missing something essential, and that if we had this something they offer, we would be fulfilled. They then encourage us to shop, convincing us that shopping will do today what it failed to do yesterday. That it would fill what the French religious philosopher Pascal who all you guys found in your math books as a kid. I love that. He says that they would fill the God-shaped vacuum, as he would call it. So I argue with you this morning, for many of us, we don't need to change our view of finances. I believe we need to change our view of the gospel. This isn't a financial problem. This is a gospel problem, where I would argue that we don't see ourselves as carriers of the gospel and creatives of the kingdom. The church today does not see themselves as carriers of the gospel or creatives of the kingdom. I would dare you to write that down somewhere. And ask yourself that question this week. What does it look like that me, I, myself, am a carrier of the gospel and a creative of the kingdom? And I would argue that for many of us, our stuff and how we view our stuff gets in the way of that. So there's a passage that I wanted to close with today. And I know as I read this, many of you are going to be like, man, Mike is like going off script again. And that, that's just like one of my favorite things to do is to go off script. But I'm going to read this and I'm going to explain to you how I think it's relevant to our discussion today. It's Colossians uh, chapter 1 verse 24. It says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now you're like, what does that have to do with what I have? 
what does it look like? You know, Paul says that he's suffering and he's filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I don't have time to go into all the deep theological things rooted in this text, but I do have time to share. I believe for many of us, we cover up our sufferings by buying more. We cover up our sufferings by creating less risk in our life, which is honestly amazing that we need to do things like insurance. Uh, no, no offense, Philip. We, <laughs> I just said that and looked over. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> but those are things that we need in our lives because of the culture that we live in. You would be foolish not to have insurance on your car or on your home, right? But really, at the end of the day, what are those things? Those things limit the risk of what I can lose. It's built upon a culture that is about what I have. And so I'm not telling you to go get rid of those things. I'm sharing that so that we would be conscious of the culture that we live in. And I share this text, and I'm going to continue, that we would be conscious as we walk through trials and tribulations, as we walk through periods of struggle, that we would realize that for many of us, we try to cover up those trials by gaining more, by having more, by creating less risk, creating more security. Connie uh, sent me a text this week. And in that text, it was a quote I believe she found or she heard, or maybe she summarized, but it says, not everyone when they go into darkness takes advantage of it. You can partner with your suffering and become a better version of yourself, or you can fight your suffering and bring more damage to yourself. Partnering with your suffering doesn't mean you enjoy it. It just means you are brave enough to say that it matters, and you'll ask God what he has for you in it. Again, I believe that in our culture, it's easy for us to try to cover up the challenges that God brings our way by the security of consuming. Paul continues, and he says, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And then he says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. He says, I am a steward of the gospel. Again, my friends, this issue of money, this issue of stuff, it's not about better financing. It's not about, you know, I could stand here and I could have put a sermon together to you talking about like, hey, live off 80%, give 10%, and save another 10%. I, and I could have done that, and I believe that there's some good biblical truths in there. But I felt like the better message for us to hear is how do we become stewards of the gospel better? Because I believe that as we better steward the gospel that has been given to us, that changes how we use, utilize the things that God has given us. I don't have time to read the whole text, but verse 28, it says, The mystery in a nutshell is that just this. Christ is in you, so therefore you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message, as our message today was about, was adding to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ, no more, no less. It's a paraphrase of the last verse in that chapter. And again, this week as my time wraps up, I just kept coming back to that question. What does it look like for me to be a carrier of the gospel? And what does it look like for me to be a creative of the kingdom? The kingdom of God, not my kingdom. 
My kingdom's fun to build. But I can tell you from experience, at the end, my kingdom finds no value. My kingdom leaves me empty and void. But as I learn to become a carrier and a creative of God's kingdom, I can tell you that I find more security. I find more hope. And I'll leave you with this. How we view God and his church affects our view of money. If we view the church as a variety of religious experiences that I attend, then I will see my giving as to an institution and tend to measure my own consumption of goods. Basically, if I see my giving, if I see the church only as a place of religious experience, then my giving reflects on how much I think I get from you. And that is totally polar opposite of the kingdom of God. That is a world religion of consumerism. But if I view the church as me and not a place that I go, if I view the church as me and my previewed witness to the world, again, I am a carrier of the gospel and a creative of the kingdom. If I view the church as me and my previewed witness to the world, as fruit of the Spirit of God acting in the world through my own transformation story, then my material wealth is less about what I can gain in this world and more about what I can leave behind as a legacy.